Hello, and welcome to this Ethical Dilemma in Science, where we're going to take a look at hydropower and ask the question, is it damned if you do and damned if you don't? So to start out with, uh, we're basically looking at the power of water, basically using water as a source of non-carbon emitting renewable uh, form of energy. Uh, but to keep in mind, uh, water has been used for thousands of years as a power source. And so we're going to start out relatively basic, take a look at the power of water, uh, and then move closer and closer to the use of water to generate usable forms of energy in our technological uh, and energy uh, dependent uh, society. So uh, in this slide, uh, we're taking a look at uh, an example uh, of the Colorado River uh, flowing through uh, the Glen Canyon, uh, flowing through a region between the Glen Canyon Dam uh, and uh, Lee's Ferry. Uh, and, and so what we can see is that over a period of thousands and thousands and, and probably even millions of years, uh, we've got the Colorado River uh, that has flowed through this region basically started out, you know, kind of relatively close to the surface uh, and gradually kind of eroded away more and more over a extended period of time. Uh, so we're looking at uh, the power of water basically has a, a lot of potential. Uh, and it, you know, in this case, uh, over a very, very long period of time, was able to do some really uh, kind of incredible changes uh, to the landscape. Uh, if we take a look at this, again, the, the relationship of water, in this case looking specifically at rivers, uh, in addition to providing lots and lots of power uh, in the form of power and terraforming, you know, kind of eroding away uh, that, that canyon on the previous slide, rivers are also a, a source of lifeblood uh, for biological diversity. Uh, so in this slide, uh, two regions, uh, two creeks uh, in Nevada. Uh, so we've got a dry creek bed over here uh, on the left. Uh, you know, probably floods, you know, a couple times a year. Uh, but then, you know, it, it basically kind of dries up. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we've got an example of, I think this is the, the Beaver Dam kind of in the back region over here. Uh, we've got an area where we basically have collected uh, the water uh, into a region, uh, and so it fills up when it rains, uh, and there's enough there that it doesn't evaporate uh, during the, the drier uh, seasons. Uh, and so what we can see then is that with this area, uh, the, the presence of the beaver dam, the, the collecting of the water within this area, it's very, very dramatically changed uh, the ecosystem. It's changed the, you know, the habitats that are available uh, for living creatures to live in this area. Uh, so if we take a look at rivers, rivers are an example of fresh water. Uh, and freshwater ecosystems represent less than 1% uh, of the Earth's surface. But within those regions, the regions right around uh, freshwater, around lakes and, and, and rivers, what we can see is that it's going to be uh, home to uh, over 10% of our known species, uh, and it's estimated to that a third of our known uh, vertebrate species are, are going to be found within this region. So again, very, very dramatic effects associated with the power of water, in this case, biological diversity. We can also see uh, that rivers have the ability to really change what's going on uh, in terms of like agricultural quality of land. Uh, so uh, over here uh, on the left-hand portion uh, of this slide, uh, we've got a satellite image uh, of Egypt. Uh, and so we've got uh, Cairo uh, kind of in this region right here. We've got the Nile River uh, actually flowing north, uh, going into the Mediterranean Sea up here at the top. Uh, but within this region, this kind of triangular region right through here, uh, we've got a, what's referred to as a river delta. Within this river delta, this is going to be a location where uh, the sediment that has been eroded away, if we want to think about what occurred right along that Colorado River, you know, digging out that canyon, uh, rivers are going to be carrying sediment. They're going to be carrying um, basically really rich soil, uh, nutrient-rich soil, uh, that as that river slows, in this case kind of down here before it gets uh, kind of closer into uh, the region where it's going to dump into the Mediterranean Sea, it's going to deposit uh, that nutrient-rich silt, that no nutrient-rich uh, kind of um, soil uh, that's being uh, carried down within that, that sediment that's being carried down. Uh, so what we end up with then is this very biologically diverse region, which is also very, very fertile uh, for agriculture. And we can see that that's going to be very important for uh, ancient societies. Uh, kind of going along with this, this is a, a 
kind of a map rendition uh, of land use uh, in the region uh, of the Nile Delta. Uh, again, Cairo down here, kind of the base of this. Uh, and then lots of irrigated plains here, uh, which have the opportunity then uh, to serve as uh, agricultural uh, land. So be able to serve as uh, kind of the area where uh, we're going to be growing um, you know, the, the needed food uh, for individuals within the area. It's going to be in these areas around the, the, the river where we have irrigation and, and fertile soil, uh, as opposed to further away where we're going to have dryness and uh, you know sandy uh, environments that aren't going to be very conducive uh, to growing of uh, plants uh, for food. We can also see uh, that water has been very, very important for transporting materials, whether we're talking about cargo or, or people. Uh, moving them on boats is going to be very, very efficient, moving them across oceans, moving them up and down rivers. Uh, so an example of this, uh, again, on the, the left-hand portion of this slide, uh, we've got uh, a barge uh, often being pulled by, uh, you know, I think it was donkeys uh, now, or no, these were mules, I think. Uh, basically being pulled by something, um, you know, horse-like creature, donkey, or a mule. Uh, and they're going to be carrying, um, and basically walking along this towpath uh, and then dragging behind this barge, carrying the materials that are there. Uh, this was, you know, 150 years ago, 1883 was the time uh, this book was originally published. Uh, but we're still seeing, you know, very, very large cargo ships, uh, container ships uh, that are going to be present uh, and delivering these materials uh, very, very efficiently uh, using this power of water. Uh, if we take a look at historical transportation in light of our concerns about carbon emissions, uh, pollution associated with uh, fossil fuel burning, um, lots of travel uh, of cargo by road, uh, but that generates uh, a lot of carbon emissions, roughly uh, about 20 billion uh, ton kilometers uh, of cargo are transported along roads um, in, the, in the world uh, each year. Uh, and they generate about 1.8 billion, billion with a B, tons of carbon emissions. Uh, in contrast, uh, travel by sea, cargo travel by sea, uh, is roughly you know, about four times as much as what we see traveled by uh, trucks uh, being traveled on the roads. Uh, but they have uh, less than half of the amount of carbon emissions. Uh, and so four times the amount of cargo transported at half the carbon emission cost. So there's a lot of value then uh, to transport materials uh, on these watery areas, whether we're talking rivers uh, or oceans. This is especially prevalent uh, if we take a look at ancient civilizations. Uh, they really emphasize uh, the importance that these civilizations placed on uh, the nearness, the, uh, the ability to get to water. Uh, for, again, uh, transportation of goods, transportation of people, uh, as well as irrigation of, of fields uh, for the growth of foods. Uh, and so we can see that in many of the ancient civilizations, they developed along fertile river valleys. Uh, and so we've got uh, the Fertile Crescent uh, in the Tigris and Euphrates region, uh, first settled, uh, estimated about 6,000 uh, years ago, about 4,000 uh, BCE. Uh, Egypt uh, over here, um, again, that Nile region uh, extending up from both the Nile Delta uh, to that region right around the Nile River, uh, you know, about you know, 5,000 years ago maybe, uh, populated about 3,000 BC. Uh, Indus Valley uh, over here uh, in India, uh, and then uh, the uh, China uh, also had uh, fertile uh, river valleys uh, in the areas of the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers. Uh, and it's estimated that that was actually uh, first settled uh, about 9500 BCE, so roughly 11,000 years ago, a little over 11,000 years ago, uh, indicating, again, the importance of the uh, water and the proximity to water for these ancient civilizations. So as we come closer and closer to this modern technological age, where we are highly dependent uh, upon access to water, uh, we can say, okay, how, or not access to water, access to power, uh, we can ask the question, where are we going to be getting power from? Uh, historically, uh, again, looking at uh, the use of harnessing water, uh, we've got an example of a water mill here. Uh, and so, you know, water uh, is being diverted, uh, kind of flows down, uh, rolls over uh, this water wheel, uh, and in the process of the water flowing over the water wheel, it's going to cause it to spin. 
Uh, and now what happens then is that we can harness that power. You can see this within mills, and this is an example of a grist mill, a, a, a mill for grain, grinding grain. Uh, we've got the water wheel uh, kind of turning here. It's going to turn a series of gears. That gear is, is going to turn another gear, which in essence is going to turn a stone. Uh, and so within the area where we're going to be grinding the grain, what's basically happening is that the grain is going to be coming down from the top. Uh, it's going to flow into the situation. Uh, the water wheel is basically turning uh, through a series of gears, turning this upper runner stone, one of these millstones, uh, and it's going to turn that millstone uh, above the bedstone, this non-moving stone uh, uh, below it. Uh, so that as that grain is put through there, it's going to be ground. It's going to grind the, crate, the grain down uh, and generate uh, a, a meal over here. You know, this, you know, if you put corn in, you get cornmeal uh, as a precursor for what we would get today as modern flour, which has actually been ground down more than what we do uh, in this, this simple uh, example here. So we can find a way in which these mills can harness the power of water to generate the, the needed power, the needed energy to run a series of machines. So in this case, we're grinding uh, grain, you know, grinding corn or wheat uh, to make, uh, make the equivalent of flour. Other examples of this, uh, you could have a sawmill where instead of turning these, um, these uh, drawing a blank on the millstones, instead of turning the millstone, uh, we would be moving a saw blade uh, and basically uh, cutting uh, the wood down into planks. Uh, textile mills, uh, you would ho uh, hook up this system of gears into a system that would be, you know, uh, working with uh, textiles or working with uh, preparing uh, cotton into threads, things like that. So we end up with this situation then uh, that we can see that, you know, humanity has, has been dependent upon uh, proximity to water for our civilizations, uh, dependent upon water for you know irrigation for our agriculture, dependent upon water for uh, transport of, of people and, and goods. Uh, but then we take a look at this. You know, water is kind of uncontrollable. Uh, in this case, uh, looking uh, in uh, fall 2021, uh, Western United States, we've got examples here uh, where we're looking at a drought along the Colorado River. Uh, it's dropped it down to, you know, kind of unbelievably low levels, you know, levels that we haven't seen previously in, in a very long period of time, probably uh, before recorded history. Uh, and at the same time, uh, over here, uh, other regions uh, in British Columbia uh, and Washington, so, you know, just a you know, state or two away, uh, we're looking at uh, fears of flooding. Uh, in this case, we've got a pretty extensive flood kind of going down through the main street. You can see some houses and buildings uh, that are partially uh, kind of covered up with water. Uh, and so, you know, we've got this situation. We want to be near water, uh, but water has a lot of risks associated with it. Um, that potentially have to be tamed. And so an example of the taming of the rivers, the taming of the water, uh, was conducted you know, in the 1930s, beginning in the 1930s, uh, with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, we have the Tennessee River uh, that kind of runs through here, uh, kind of oversimplifying this a little bit. Uh, but basically, we have this situation, uh, a mountainous region, uh, you know, nice prominent river, uh, but uh, high mountains on either side, so that when it rains, the rivers flood. Uh, and when the rivers flood, it is going to carry that flood water downstream uh, and potentially impact on the communities that are down uh, downstream to that area, potentially flooding them out, you know, at the loss of, of people uh, and property um, and, and materials, things like that. Uh, and so what happened when the Tennessee Valley Authority, beginning in the 1930s, uh, is they went through uh, and in an effort to kind of minimize flood damage, reduce the flood damage that was coming with this, uh, is they put in a series of dams. Uh, they also put in a series of locks uh, so that boats could get kind of above the dams uh, as they're going through. Uh, and they were able to control uh, the flow of water. Um, and so it was not this uncontrollable flood when it rains, uh, water would build up, and then they would be able to regulate the release of that uh, from the dams. Along the way, uh, they were able to um, build in 29 dams, which were capable of producing hydroelectric power. Uh, now, keep in mind, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, still had, uh, at this point, uh, still a coal-burning plants uh, showing up here in purple, 
uh, natural gas burning plants here uh, in the kind of darker blue, uh, where our hydro plants are, are kind of this aqua blue. They've also got a couple uh, nuclear power plants that are present there. Uh, and so, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority started out to, you know, kind of mediate or uh, reduce flood damage within this region. Uh, but they're doing a whole lot. They're generating power. Uh, they're controlling the flow of water. Uh, and they're also improving the water quality. Uh, they're improving uh, and making a more reliable water supply within this region. Uh, and in the process of doing so, they're also, you know, building up uh, kind of reservoirs, building up the equivalent of lakes kind of above uh, the uh, dams. Uh, and in doing so, what they're going to end up is uh, generating places for uh, uh, recreation. Now, if we take a look at the kind of moving closer to this concept of hydroelectricity, uh, water uh, generating electricity, uh, what we can see is that as of 2021, uh, and this is information from the Ener U.S. Energy Information Administration, uh, we can see that there are a few regions, uh, you know, uh, best example is uh, Washington uh, up here in the corner, uh, but Oregon, uh, California, uh, Alabama, Tennessee, uh, as well as New York, uh, have a fair amount of potential for generating electricity using hydropower. Uh, other states have varying levels of uh, hydroelectric uh, generation plants, uh, but in general, what we're seeing is that as of 2021, uh, we were able to produce uh, about 6.5% of the total U.S. energy needs, uh, electricity needs, uh, through the use of hydropower, these hydroelectric plants. So if we take a look at this, what is going on? How is it that this is actually going to be working? Uh, and so we've got a schematic here, uh, again, uh, from um, looking at uh, make sure I get the pointer on the right side. Uh, we've got uh, a dam th that's located here. We've got the reservoir behind it. Uh, and so what happens then with this dam, uh, it basically builds up this reservoir. Water is able to flow you know, kind of downhill. Uh, and as it's flowing downhill, it's going to go into this generation facility, into this uh, region where we're going to have not, not a water wheel, but the equivalent of a water wheel like we had with that mill. Uh, so the water flowing through here uh, is going to spin this turbine. They're going to spin the blades on this like we spun the water wheel within the mill. Uh, and in doing so, what that's going to do uh, is effectively rotate uh, or spin a coil of metal of wire within a magnetic field. Uh, and that's what's going to generate the electricity. Spinning the wire, wire within this magnetic field uh, is going to generate uh, the electricity. Uh, and so in this way, we are able to convert the energy you know, associated with this flow of water, this running water, uh, into electricity that we can use to power our homes, power our you know, cell phones, you know, if you've got an electrical car to provide the energy to uh, provide uh, energy, electricity for that. So when we take a look at hydroelectric plants, uh, the most common one are going to be examples of these impoundment facilities. With these impoundment facilities, what you're going to see is going to be a relatively large dam, often, you know, kind of multiple kind of powerhouses or at least multiple turbines that can run generators to uh, generate electricity. So you're talking about a large scale uh, production uh, and capabilities of producing lots and lots of electricity. Uh, but in order to do so, uh, it means that you've got to build up a relatively large kind of obstruction to the river. Uh, you got to block off the river with this impoundment dam, uh, and then you're going to flood kind of upstream to that. You're going to form this relatively large reservoir uh, that is going to fill up with, with water. Uh, and in many cases, that filling up with the water is going to change the, the properties of uh, that region. Uh, the water is going to accumulate there. Uh, it's going to slow down, you know, maybe drop some sediment within this region, which is a problem. Uh, and it's also going to change the, the temperature of the water, uh, change the amount of uh, oxygen within the water. Uh, if we've got uh, fish that need to swim upstream to spawn, like we would see um, along the, uh, the west coast, uh, you know, we, we have some problems that we need to kind of resolve. In this case, we've got a fish ladder kind of running up along the side. Uh, the fish can kind of jump up, rest, jump up a little further, jump up uh, and, and basically get up and above uh, this impoundment facility, this impoundment dam. Now, an alternative uh, to the impoundment, these large dams, 
uh, are these much smaller run of river facilities. And with a run of river facility, it's still based on the flow of water, based on water flowing downhill. Uh, but instead of, you know, damming off the entire river, oftentimes uh, it's basically going to be associated with diverting uh, a portion of the river's flow uh, into a canal, uh, kind of move it over towards the, the facilities for producing the electricity. Uh, it then, again, is going to flow down, um, you know, down by gravity, spin the, the, the turbines, generate electricity. Uh, but in general, these run-of-the-river facilities are going to be a whole lot smaller. Um, in some cases, they don't require a dam because they're not completely blocking off the river. They're just diverting a, a portion of the flow of that. Uh, and so because of that, they're going to be limited in the amount of energy that they're going to be able to produce. So as opposed to an impoundment facility, your traditional hydroelectric plant producing hundreds or thousands of megawatts, just a, a unit of electricity, you know, a million watts, uh, you know, a normal light bulb, you know, like a 60 watt bulb or a 90 watt bulb. Um, instead of generating, you know, a thousand megawatts, a thousand mi times million of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, thousands of megawatts, a megawatt would be a, a million watts, uh, you may be producing within a run of the river facility only, you know, one megawatt or, you know, maybe 10 megawatts uh, in that. Uh, these run of the river facilities are, are a lot faster to build. Uh, they're a little bit cheaper, uh, but they, again, they're not able to produce as much electricity as those larger facilities. They're also going to tend to be a little bit less reliable uh, without that kind of reservoir built up behind it. Uh, during a drought, uh, during a, a drier season, when the flow of the river kind of slows down or is diminished in some way, uh, it may not have enough water to divert into this canal uh, in order to generate electricity. Now, again, because this is a smaller facility, because it's got uh, some limitations and, and it's less reliable, uh, there's generally a higher cost for generating electricity uh, within the smaller scale structures as opposed to uh, these large-scale structures. These traditional hydroelectric plants with the impoundment dams uh, are very large. Uh, they're very expensive to put in, uh, but there's an economy of scale. If you can you know, build up a reservoir and have multiple turbines being present, you're able to produce a lot of electricity where the run of the river plants may only be able to run one or possibly two or three uh, turbines uh, in that area. Uh, so basically, they're limited in their ability to uh, produce electricity. So two different models uh, for generating electricity from the flow of water. Uh, and if we take a look at this, you know, there are, you know, some, you know, caveats. There are some problems uh, associated with uh, damming rivers uh, in order to produce electricity. Uh, and so an example of this, uh, uh, on the uh, left-hand portion of the slide over here, uh, we're looking at uh, the Chinese sturgeon. Um, it's a type of fish. Uh, the, the lines uh, represent the number of sturgeons uh, that were present uh, in these rivers. Uh, and then these red dashed lines represent when they put dams uh, associated with the Three Gorges uh, dam project starting in about... Uh, uh, Three Gorges started in, in the early 2000s. The first dam started out uh, in 1981. Uh, you can see that disrupting the river uh, with these dams has dramatically ca has caused a dramatic decline uh, in the number of uh, the sturgeon fish uh, that are in that area. Uh, and it's thought, uh, you know, there, it's, uh, there are fears that this could be contributing to a possible extinction event uh, because these sturgeons are not able to get back up to their spawning grounds. Uh, it's already thought that uh, the damming of these rivers may have caused the extension of the Chinese river dolphin, uh, and the Yangtze uh, softshell turtle. Uh, along the uh, right-hand portion of the slide, uh, we've got a higher magnification view of a uh, fish ladder. Uh, this is a fish ladder along the Lower Snake River, uh, where again, we've got an impoundment dam up here at the top. What happens is the fish basically get in, uh, they swim up this, uh, and there are little areas in this where they can rest uh, to kind of move their way up the, the fish ladder uh, and get past uh, this dam. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, this still uh, causes uh, uh, the fish to expend a lot of energy uh, to go up this to fight the current, uh, to get up and over um, this facility, over this dam. Uh, and we're causing changes to the dynamics of the water, we're changing the properties of the water. 
Uh, the dams, again, are going to slow down the water, it'll cause stagnation of the water, potentially changes in the water temperature uh, because it's not flowing uh, along its natural path. We can also take a look at you know, what happens uh, kind of upstream to this area. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're taking a look at the fact that, you know, in most cases, as we said before, you know, you, you've got those uh, fertile river valleys where uh, civilization started out, you know, 9,000 years ago, uh, 11,000 years ago in some cases. We've got lots and lots of cities uh, that are built uh, along the length of these rivers. Uh, and if you're going to go through and start to dam up those rivers, what happens to the people that are living in that area? What happens? Uh, to a city or a town or a village uh, that may be present there, uh, as we build up the uh, build up the reservoir, uh, we're in effect going to flood out those regions. Uh, so in this case, uh, looking at the Grand Coulee Dam uh, out in I think that's in Washington, um, you know, even though it was built, I know almost 70 years ago now at this point, uh, in 2019, Congress finally uh, approved. Uh, a compensation pattern uh, for the Spokane uh, tribe, the indigenous people that had lived on that land, uh, are going to be compensated uh, for the lands they lost through the flooding uh, and the generation of the, the reservoir. Uh, if we take a look at the, the Three Gorges project uh, along the Yangtze River uh, in China, again, uh, a very important region for kind of flood control uh, as well as generation of electricity, um, they lost about 100,000 acres of very fertile land uh, that are produced about set, uh, produce about 40% uh, of Chinese grains and about 70% uh, of Chinese rice. Uh, we're in this region. You can see kind of the kind of lighter purple area uh, are the regions that were flooded. Uh, and you can see in many cases uh, there are cities, uh, towns, and villages that were moved. Uh, relocation uh, associated with this project moved about 1.2 million people uh, because they flooded three cities, uh, 110 towns. Uh, and over a thousand villages to be able to come up with uh, the hydroelectric plant uh, for the Three Gorges River, which again is going to be producing a lot of electricity uh, for China. We can also take a look at the effects, and the, these are just two examples of papers, uh, taking a look at the effects uh, downstream from the dams. Uh, as I said, uh, if we take a look at the uh, Nile Delta, uh, very, very fertile uh, ground, very, very fertile soil, nutrient-rich soil, uh, because it gets replenished each year uh, as that sediment flows down the river. Uh, if these rivers are starting to be dammed up, uh, that sediment doesn't flow all the way down the river. It gets trapped behind the dams. Uh, in some cases, it builds up and you know, it has to be dredged out or you know, potentially could you know, interfere with the function of the dam. Uh, but in doing so, it, it really kind of degrades um, the downstream agricultural lands, making it very difficult uh, for those areas to you know, support agriculture, to be able to produce the foods uh, that are needed uh, for uh, survival. And that gives rise to the ethical dilemma uh, for this topic uh, for uh, water power. Uh, and, and realize that we're oversimplifying this to, to a great deal. Uh, there are lots and lots of different factors that go into a decision as to where to place uh, a hydroelectric uh, power plant. Uh, so, you know, again, recognize that this is a little bit of an oversimplification. Uh, and so the question is, you know, what principle should be considered in the decision uh, about a run-of-the-river uh, design, run-of-the-river uh, uh, power plant, versus an impoundment dam. And keep in mind, the, the run of the river uh, oftentimes does not require kind of damming off the entire river. Uh, and, you know, you're basically just diverting a portion of that uh, to drive the, the generators. Uh, in contrast, the impoundment dams, uh, you know, are, are going to completely dam off a river, uh, build up a reservoir kind of above the river, you know, make some changes to kind of the ecological properties. And I realize I'm probably biasing you in, in the statement. Uh, but, but basically, the, the impoundment uh, dams uh, are much larger. Uh, and they have a reservoir uh, associated with it. So what type of decisions uh, or what principles should be involved with the decision making for a, a run of the river versus an impoundment dam for the generation of electricity? Uh, and so various factors that can include, you know, should we consider, you know, kind of the small ecological footprint, you know, possibly over uh, extended areas uh, or uh, kind of a large ecological impact uh, or an eruption over a single area. 
Uh, and keep in mind that these uh, impoundment dams tend to be much larger and capable of generating much larger amounts of electricity. Uh, and so if we have a smaller run of the river uh, facility, you're probably going to need more of those uh, because they're much more limited um, and basically involved with producing local power uh, as opposed to the impoundment dam facilities that can produce uh, really regional power, you know, a power that is going to extend over a greater area. Uh, other possible uh, principles. Uh, should we consider what type of land uh, is going to be impacted by uh, the building of either of types of these dams? Now, in most cases, uh, endangered uh, wetlands uh, will be preserved uh, and kind of, kind of kept from being developed uh, under these circumstances. Uh, but what happens uh, if what we're looking at is going to be a relatively rare but unprotected wetland? It uh, doesn't matter uh, if it's agricultural land, like we saw with the Three Gorges Dam uh, in Chaya, or the potential uh, that we're actually going to be building this in an area that has developed land. And again, keep in mind that in many cases, um, cities and towns built up along rivers historically. Uh, and so if we're going to be flooding a region, oftentimes the region that's going to be flooded uh, will have an impact on you know, already developed areas. Uh, other principles to consider. Uh, does it matter if it's going to be a populated city that's going to affect lots and lots of different people, uh, or if it's a smaller town affecting less people, or you know, getting to the point where we're taking a look at isolated rural homes, where you know the impact on this is going to be you know pretty significant for you know a small group of individuals, uh, but potentially at an advantage or advantageous uh, position, you know, a benefit to a much larger. A group of individuals that need, you know, carbon emission free, uh, a source of clean energy. So um, lots of different things that you consider about uh, when making a decision about what type of dam to put in uh, to gain access to a carbon free, you know, potentially renewable source of clean energy. Yeah, get my slides moving forward. Uh, and again, I'll post some references uh, below in the links or uh, the links uh, in the references below. Uh, so please keep in mind if you want additional information, uh, that is going to be there. Uh, and as always, thank you for listening to this Ethical Dilemma in Science. Uh, we'll be posting another one uh, coming up soon. Thank you and have a great day.